God will come through for you. Genesis chapter 24 is where we're at. And we're going to start in verse 10. Genesis chapter 24, starting in verse 10, it says, And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. For all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray you, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Verse 13, behold, I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of men of the city come out to draw water and let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down your pitcher, I pray you that I may drink and she, sh and she shall say, drink and I will give your camels drink also. Let the same be she that you have appointed for your servant Isaac and thereby shall I know that you have showed kindness unto my master. Last verse we'll read, verse 15. And it came to pass, before he had done speaking, behold, Rebekah came out. I'm going to read that line one more time, and that's where we're going to stop. We're not going to read the rest of that verse. And it came to pass, before he had done speaking, that behold, Rebecca came out. Pray with me and for me as I minister a sermon entitled, God Knows and God Moves. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. And Lord, we would be amiss to not thank you for your grace and your mercy that you bestow on us every single day. Lord, every day that we wake up, your Bible, your word says that your mercies are new every morning Great is your faithfulness. And God, we praise you for the faithfulness that you show us every day. Lord, I pray that you would be with us tonight, that your spirit would go forth and minister to our hearts the word that you have for us tonight. And we ask all these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen and amen. Abraham and Sarah are two people that everyone in here, everyone watching probably knows. They've heard the names They've heard the stories. If you were raised in church, you know these stories because they're told in children's church. Back in my day, it was the old, what were they called, flannel? It was like the little flanograph or whatever it was called, the little pieces that stuck to the board. And they would tell the stories as they would read them and put the characters on the board and talk about the characters. So this story, this story that I'm telling today is not going to be anything new. But I pray that these truths that I'd like to bring out that the Lord laid on my heart would minister to every single one of you. Abraham and Sarah, they were faithful people to God. Paul in Romans chapter 4 would write, Abraham would stumble not at the promises of God. His faith would remain in the promise that God had made to him. God would make him two promises. Number one, God promised him a land. God promised him Canaan. The land that you're in is going to belong to you and to your ancestors. And Abraham would talk to God and say, well, I, I don't have a son. I have no one to inherit this land. And God would say, no, here's the second promise. You will have a son. He would confirm that time and time again. At one moment, he's having dinner. God is having dinner that Abraham had made for him. And God confirms in the promise, except this time says, this time next year. Before it was a distant promise, now a time is set. Hey, this time next year, you're going to have a son. Your wife will have a son. Sarah hears it and laughs. And right there, God says, is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for me? 
Abraham and Sarah would find out that answer, in one year's time, the promise of God comes true, and they realize nothing is too hard for God. That there's nothing that's impossible for God. Nothing impossible for God. But they would be tested. Abraham would be tried. That promised son I gave you, Abraham, sacrifice him to me. Give him up. Go to a mountain, Mount Moriah. Bring your son. Lay him on the altar and sacrifice him. The promise. This was God's promise to Abraham and Sarah that in your old age, you are going to do the impossible by giving birth and having a son. He will be the one to take the inheritance. He's the one that the descendants will come through. So many that you can't even number them. But Abraham took his son, goes to Mount Moriah, looks at his servants and says, you stay here. Me and the lad are going to go worship. And here's a statement of faith. And we will return to you. We learn in Hebrews that he believed that even if God had to raise Isaac from the dead, that God would come through for him. Again, he had already seen the impossible done. His faith is starting to grow, but now it had to be tested. And he would lay Isaac down, but before he would lower the knife, God would stop him and provide himself a lamb. Provide himself a sacrifice. He had seen so much. Sarah and Abraham had seen God move powerfully. And at this time, in Genesis chapter 24, Sarah had already passed away. At 127 years old, she had passed away. And Abraham was there at the beginning of Genesis 24, and I didn't come here to preach this verse, but it's good, so I'm going to read it. Genesis chapter 20, uh, 24 and verse 1, and Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Think about that. The Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. You see, whenever you follow God, when you choose to follow his way, when you choose to follow his path, blessings are a guarantee. I'm going to say that again one more time so it seeps into your heart tonight. When you follow God and his way, when you follow God and his path, blessings are guaranteed. Now, it might not seem like it sometimes. We all go through those valleys. We all go through those storms. But God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. And that by itself is a blessing. When I'm going through the trials of life, when storms are raging and it feels like my boat is sinking and I have no hope and I feel like I'm going to die, he never leaves me, and he never forsakes me. That's a promise of God that he has never forgotten, and that he has never left your side. That's a blessing. But Abraham wasn't just blessed in one thing here and one thing there. He was blessed in all things. God wants to bless you in all aspects of your life. I won't back down from saying that just because that has been perverted over the last few years. God still is a blessing God. God still is a blessing God. He wants to pour out his blessing that you won't have room to receive. That song, your blessing, your blessing is coming through. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless you tonight. Abraham was blessed in all things. There was one thing that was missing, though. His son, about 37 years old at this time, did not have a wife, did not have a helpmate. 
So he calls his oldest servant, his eldest servant, Eliezer. And he gives him this task. This task that he needs to complete. He asks him to promise, to shake on it, to make a deal, to do three things. Number one, not to allow Isaac to marry a Canaanite. That was one of the first things that Abraham said, Eliezer, come here, put your hand under my thigh. We have to make this deal. We have to make this promise. Make sure Isaac does not take a wife that's a Canaanite. Why? Because he was set apart from those in Canaan. God would make the same call to the Israelites as they were going into the promised land after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later after this would tell them, do not take wives from the nations around you. Why? Because they're going to turn your heart away from me. Abraham and his godly wisdom would see this and realize, Isaac, you cannot marry someone that's from here. You need to be set apart. You need to be consecrated because God has a plan for you. You and I, we should be consecrated to God. You and I, that's not a popular thing to talk about, but I'm going to say it anyways. You and I, we should be set apart to God's way and God's plan. That doesn't mean isolation. That doesn't mean that I shut myself off from everyone and everything and I just stay in my little cubby hole. God hasn't called us to be hermits and go hide off somewhere. God has called us to the world to reach the world and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and am crucified. But while you're out in the world, you are not supposed to become the world. You are supposed to be set apart. Isaac was in the land of Canaan, but he was not supposed to marry someone. He was not supposed to compromise. Instead, the second part of the promise, the second part of the deal, Eliezer, don't let him take a woman, a wife from Canaan. Instead, go to my country and pull someone from there. This would keep the bloodline pure for the Christ. This would keep the bloodline pure. You see, there's times in Scripture we get little glimpses where Satan tried to destroy the lineage of Christ so he couldn't come at all. But that plan failed. That plan failed. Every time Satan tried, he failed. Because no weapon formed will prosper. Don't let Isaac marry someone from this land. Go to my land. Pull a wife from there. And number three, the third part of this promise, Eliezer says, okay, Abraham, let's say I go and I find this woman. Let's say I find the woman God has for him. I give her the things you ask me to give her. I tell her I've got a husband waiting for you and she refuses to come. Should I come get Isaac and bring him and then we can come back together? Abraham says, no. Third part, do not bring Isaac with you. If she refuses to come, it's better that he not marry than for him to go and never come back. You see, Isaac was not supposed to set foot in that land. In fact, out of all of the patriarchs of Israel, all of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Isaac is the only one that never left the land of promise. Never. Abraham would leave. It's not on my notes, but it's in early Genesis 13, I believe, 14 maybe where there's a famine in the land and he goes down into Egypt. You know, I've heard it preached here before. Down signifies him leaving the will of God. Signifies him leaving where God had called him to. 
So he went down into Egypt. That's where he would get Hagar. And Hagar would be where he would make Ishmael. One thing after another after another. You see, when you leave the will of God, well, it's just a little, little thing. You don't understand. There's not enough food for my family. I've, I've got to go down into Egypt. You need to trust God and his way. God can create an oasis in the middle of a desert. If he spoke the world into existence, how much more can he speak provision into your life? Isaac was the only one that never left the land of promise. Paul would say it this way in Romans chapter 8, what shall separate you from the love of God? Shall famine, shall peril, shall sword? And all these things we are more than conquerors. I'm paraphrasing. But is there anything that can separate you from the love of God? What's the love of God? It's the cross of Christ. God commendeth his love towards us, showed us his love, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What will separate you from God and his love? These were the three things that Eliezer was told, was asked, make this deal. This is your task. Go do it. Eleazar hears and he agrees. Accepts the task, makes his way over to Mesopotamia. First, he grabs 10 camels. In fact, the scripture says that all things were in his hand. All the things of his master were in his hand. He had gifts that he was going to give out to Rachel. He had gifts, or I'm sorry, Rebecca. He had gifts that he was going to give out to the family. He had gifts, and he was bringing these camels that were laden with these gifts and with the things for traveling. And he comes to the city of Nahor in Mesopotamia. It's evening time, and usually in that, those days, cities or developments would all gather and develop around wells, wells that were dug, natural wells. There were different types of wells that it could have been. But all we know is there was a well there, and because there was a well there, a city was built, the city of Nahor, the development of Nahor. And two times, usually morning and night, women would go out, as was the custom, gather water and bring it back in for their family. Eliezer gets there about the time that it was time for the women to come get water. He makes his camels kneel down, all 10 of them, and he says a prayer to God. Ultimately, this prayer, for sake of time, I won't go through every part of it, but ultimately this prayer, he was asking for a miracle. Let me explain to you why I say it was a miracle. He prays and asks, God, I want you to give me this sign. That when a, one of the women comes and I look at her and I say, hey, please give me some water. She's the one, if she not only gives me water, but of her own free will, offers to water all 10 of my camels. Well, how is that a miracle? Well, let me tell you this. This would have been a lot of work for 10 camels. Camels can drink about 20 gallons of water at one time. 20 gallons of water per camel. That's 200 gallons of water just for the camels. On average, the pot that women would carry in that day would hold about three gallons each. That means she was going, she would volunteer, voluntarily by herself say, let me water all your camels and make 67 trips from the well to the trough. 67 trips until the camels were watered. We don't know exactly what kind of well it was. There's some wells that happen naturally and would look kind of like a little lake or a little pond. 
Some wouldn't be natural, but they would be dug and would be like what we think of a well, lower the rope, get the bucket, pull it back up. But there were some wells that you had to go a long way down to get to them, and they would build stairs to go down the stairs, get the water, and back up the stairs. So imagine for a second that it was that well. That was the type of well it was. She would be carrying three gallons of water all the way, she would carry the pot all the way down, fill it with three gallons, carry it all the way back up to the trough, dump it, and do that again 67 times to put this into a picture for you, to help you maybe realize he was asking for the impossible. He was. He was asking for something that no one naturally in their right mind would be like, hey, let me water all your camels. No, I see 10 camels, I'm going, nope, nope. Not talking to that dude. Right, that, that's me, maybe it's just me, maybe it's not you. Y'all are like, yeah, I'd water those camels. No, you wouldn't. Stop. 67 times from the well to the trough, watering the camels. Just praying for a miracle, believing God for the impossible. Instead of going into the city, knocking on doors, trying to find Abraham's kin and his family and figuring all this out on his own. He said, no, I'm going to go straight to the source. I'm going to go straight to the man that can take care of things. And I'm going to see this done. Camels take a knee because God's going to work. He prays his prayer. God, work this miracle. And what's even more miraculous than him having the faith to say, God, work this miracle, verse 15, and it came to pass before he was even done speaking. Let that phrase sink in for a moment. Before he had done speaking, before the prayer was finished, before he prayed his prayer, the last words, before Eliezer could complete his sentences, the miracle was already completed. Before he was done praying, God was already moving. Eliezer couldn't even finish his prayer before God was already doing the impossible. Before God was already working, before God was already on the move. A prayer of faith moves God. A prayer of faith, no matter how impossible, no matter how impractical, and no matter how improbable, moves God. Before he was done saying it, God already knew. Faced with an impossible task. Faced with something that he didn't want to let his master down with, made a petition to God. And God heard, God knew, and God answered but I serve a God today that the Bible says is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I serve a God today that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change. So when Eliezer goes to God asking for a miracle and it moved God, guess what you and I can go to God for? Guess what you and I can see God do. God can work miracles for us. Matthew chapter 6, turn there quickly. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8. Jesus with the Sermon on the Mount, talking, the longest recorded sermon that we have of Jesus, say, says this, 
As he's teaching his disciples to pray, a few verses after Matthew 6, 8 would be the Lord's Prayer. He says this, Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. I don't have time to get into what he was saying about the Gentiles and be not like them. I don't, I don't have time for that. So for the sake of time, you'll have to study that for yourself. But I want to focus on that phrase. Your father knows what things you have need of before you even ask. Your father knows. God knows. That word knows means to see or to know, to perceive with the eyes. God sees the problem you're in right now. God sees the storm you're facing. God sees the issues at hand, and he knows. He knows what you're going through. That impossible situation, God knows about it. That wayward family member, God knows about it. That overwhelming depression, God knows about it. The fear that grips your heart every single day that no one knows about, God knows about it. The deepest, uh, darkest place in your heart that you think you've hidden from the world, God knows about it. God knows you. He knows what you're going through. He sees it. He knows. Just like he knew what Eleazar was gonna pray and started moving, before he was even finished. Those nights that you're on your knees, tears streaming down your face, crying out to God for your miracle, he knows. He knows what you're going through. But you know, I serve a God that doesn't just know, that doesn't just perceive, that doesn't just see and understand. Ephesians chapter three, verse 20. Now unto him that is able. He's able. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. You see, I serve a God that doesn't just know and doesn't watch us suffer in misery. I serve a God that knows, that sees, and is moved with compassion and uses his might and his power to intervene on your behalf. You're not getting it tonight. I serve an all-powerful, all-knowing God that can do anything. Nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible. There is nothing you face that God can't fix. No demon in hell can stand against him. I serve the creator of the universe who said, let there be light and there was light. I serve the creator that created everything that we see just by his words. But with man, formed him with his hands. And all of creation was good except for the sixth day after he created man. It was very good. If God looks after the lily, if God looks after the sparrow, how much more will he look out for you? God is able. God is able. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we can even ask or think. You think your miracle is impossible, but God wants to do even more. Sometimes we limit God. We think we're being faithful. We think we're full of faith, but we're limiting God because he wants to do more. Believe God for Baton Rouge. Yes. 
Believe God for Louisiana, yes. Believe God for the United States, yes. But we need to band together and believe God for the world. God is on the move. God is moving, he wants to do more. But on a more personal note, he wants to do more in you. Every single one of us in here, God wants to move. That bondage has to break. The sickness has to heal. That wayward family member, he wants to save. Depression has to flee. Sickness has to flee. Demons have to flee. Darkness has to flee. And even when we're in our prayer, crying out to God and it seems like it's falling on deaf ears, God is already moving on your behalf. God is already moving for you. This isn't in my notes, but I feel led to do it. In the book of Exodus chapter three, Moses at the burning bush is talking to God. And it's verse seven and verse eight. If we could put up verse seven, mainly verse seven. Exodus chapter three, verse seven. You can turn there. People of Israel, the Hebrews, enslaved for hundreds of years. There hasn't been a voice from heaven in hundreds of years. The last person to really hear from God was Joseph, and he was long dead. He was long gone. Silence. I can only imagine after hundreds of, hundreds of years of slavery, hundreds of years of being beat, hundreds of years of being forced to do something I don't want to do, crying out to God over and over and over again, God, please, you have to do something in silence. But verse seven, and the Lord said to Moses, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry, and I know their sorrows. And verse eight says, I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians. Moses standing there hearing God's voice, hearing the voice of God himself, saying, I am here to send you, Moses, hope, finally. But if you look at the point of view from the Hebrews, there was still silence. They were still in Egypt. They were still in slavery. It seemed like there was nobody home and nobody was answering. Maybe there isn't even a God. But God was already moving, doing abundantly more above all that they could even ask or think. They were asking for help and freedom was on its way. Deliverance was on its way. There's that song, singers and musicians, you can go ahead and come up. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Why? Because he's the way maker. He's the miracle worker. He's the promise keeper, the light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. My God, that is who you are. He cannot change. He's not a man that he should lie. And tonight, I'm here to confirm for you two things. God is still in the miracle working business. God is still here. He's still working miracles today and he's ready to move for you. He's ready to touch you. He's ready to heal you. He's ready to help you. He's here. And whenever you ask, and you ask, and you ask, and you feel like you've lost hope, 
that no one is there, and that you'll have to suffer. I'm here to tell you, don't stop asking. Ask and keep on asking and it will be given to you. Seek, keep on seeking and you shall find. Knock and keep on knocking and it will be open to you. Your situation may seem impossible tonight. Your situation, your prayer requests that you have laid before God may seem improbable and likely to never happen, but I'm here to tell you, the miracle worker is here. The miracle worker is here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me. That anointing is still here. His spirit is here, every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. He's here tonight. His spirit is here. If we look at our hearts, if we look at our lives, if we look at what's going around, all, all around us, we all have a need for being honest. We all have a cry to God. We all have a longing to see God do something in our hearts and in our lives. And maybe some of you in here, maybe some watching, you've lost hope. You feel like everything is over and you might as well stop asking, don't quit. If you don't quit, he won't quit. Hold on to God, because he's about to move on your situation. This altar call is simple. If you have a need, come to this altar. If you have something that you've been seeking God for, come to this altar. If you have an impossible situation that you need a breakthrough, come to this altar. If you have that family member that's given up on God, come to this altar. God wants to move on your behalf. God wants to touch you tonight. He's here and moving tonight. Don't hold back. Don't sit back. Come, petition God. He's moving for you. You are here.
lift your hands right now this morning and say, Even when I can't see it, He's working. Even when I can't feel it, He's working. working. You never stop. He never, never stops working. working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I can't see it, You're working. Even when I can't this evening that he's still able